Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here. We're live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake. And uh, if you're watching this show any other time than August 29th, it's a replay, so don't call in. But uh, since those who are watching it on August 29th, call in with your comments or questions, 651-747-3838. And if you're just not quite comfortable with doing that, email me at uh, speechlessmn at gmail.com with your comments or questions and uh, we may or may not get back to you. Uh, Anyway, but no, I I want to, we get some great ideas uh, uh, for the show and we try to implement those and um, get you information that you want to see or hear about. Of course, this show is mostly about family law and judicial accountability and things that go on in our court system. Uh, And today the main topic we'll be talking about will be the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This is a treaty that's being uh, recommended or pushed on the United States by the United Nations uh, and it covers a lot of issues that would affect Americans and other Americans with disabilities in other countries and also improve uh, the relationships with those that have disabilities living in other countries. But one of the main arguments, if you watch the Senate hearings last year uh, or earlier this year, was this is a real good thing for Americans with disabilities overseas because these Americans can get along, get around better. Uh, But there is danger in that treaty uh, with the United Nations on the Conventions on the Rights of Persons with Disability that would take away parental rights. So we're going to go through that and just discuss what these dangers are and um, that will be a large part of the show. But before that I have a couple of announcements and then uh, a couple other comments about other things in the news and an update on Ray. Widstrand, the uh, individual who works at the studios here uh, that got uh, beat up uh, severely, critically uh, on the east side of St. Paul by uh, some gang members. And so I'll give you an update on how he's doing and uh, uh, we'll go from there. But first the announcements. Um, Grant, this is something, uh, the city of Grant in Minnesota, not far from here, They have a tractor parade every year. This year, it is Saturday, September 7th. And, you know, this is just a different parade. Uh, It's just a fun parade where it's tractors and old style, you know, farm machinery. And there might be a cement mixer here or some other, I mean, and that cement mixer was something else but just some great, great machinery uh, out at this tractor parade. It's Saturday, September 7th at 12 o'clock, and it starts at the Gasthouse Bavarian Hunter Restaurant at Manning and uh, McCusick. And then um, trophies are awarded for these tractors. So even if, if you got a tractor, uh, uh, try to get it in the parade. Um, it's 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 fun. The tractors come from all over, uh, from a number of different states, but most are local. But uh, you can get prizes for the oldest one, the best recondition, uh, various types of prizes. But I don't know. There was tons of prizes out there. It's pretty good. Uh, And there's raffle prizes. It starts at noon. And I I believe also there's a lunch after the parade uh, that you can get in on and, and have. So how many parades do you go to they serve you lunch? <laughs> I mean, not, not very many. You can give a donation, but this is the um, Grant Heritage Preservation Committee, I think, something like that, that puts this on. But the parade goes from the, the Gost House restaurant to Wheelander School and back, and then the picnic afterwards. 12 o'clock, Saturday, September 7th. I drove a tractor in that yesterday. I learned how to drive the tractor that day and just had a, had a great time. Uh, it was a lot of fun, good people. Uh, don't miss that. Okay, that's the first announcement. Then uh, something new is taking place 
in, in the area here, the Senate District 43, which is uh, part of White Bear Lake, Maplewood, North St. Paul. Uh, is Oakdale? Yeah, Oakdale's part of this uh, area, but it's a motorcycle ride. It's called the uh, SD 43 Annual Elephant Ride. Uh, that's just a great picture there. And it's at Stell Mocker Park in White Bear Lake. That's where it's starting. And you'll have to go to the website, uh, www.sd43.org, and then click on events to find out where they're going on the motorcycle ride. And it's, uh, the raid, ride begins at uh, 9 a.m., same day registration at 8, 8 a.m., but there's a lunch at 1 o'clock. You don't have to go on the ride to come to the picnic. Uh, so it's a ride and a picnic, and they'll be having some games and guest speakers from uh, the political arena, and you don't even have to listen to them. But, you know, I, I would advise it. I mean, it's a good time to sit down and maybe get some one-on-one -on -one time talking to some of the uh, people that decide the policy and the relationships uh, that peop people will have between each other or the law. Um, uh, you get to talk to these people and and give them a, an earful or get to know them and, and have some fun. So uh, our freedoms and country are being uh, challenged to ride for country, ride for freedom. Uh, elephant ride, that's September 21st. So uh, get in on that and have some fun. So some good activities coming up in the, in the area and I uh, want you to know about it. Okay. Um, another thing that's been in the news lately is that uh, a man was killed by Brooklyn Center cop shot in the chest. That's the headlines for the Twin Cities or the uh, Pioneer Press uh, on the region page. And we were showing and discussing what was going on in Brooklyn Center with the police up there. Uh, Burstad, uh, Sergeant Burstad, who was part of the Metro Gang Task Force, who was shown beating a, a guy up who had surrendered, and and how that tied in with Crystal uh, Police Department and just the cover-ups that have been going up in these departments and in these areas, and what in this this man that was killed, Edmund D. Fair. Um, people that were watching this take place said they had him in handcuffs and he um, was just shot in the chest and he was complying. That's what the people that were in the van saying. Now, are they credible? Uh, we don't know. Uh, what the police are saying, according to the paper, is that the the man had a six and a half year prison sentence facing him. Now he hadn't been charged, or he hadn't been convicted, he hadn't had a sentence, but he said, it, they said he said he did not want to go back to prison. He did not have the handcuffs on. He was being arrested, but then uh, there was a tussle and it was a life-threatening situation and they shot the man in the chest. Who knows? This is why it's so important to have videos in the courtroom. How do you go from an arrest to the courtroom? <laughs> um, because it protects people in the public setting when these things are going on. The courtrooms are a public setting. It's the people's court. We should know and we should be able to see every trial that is going on in that courtroom. And when these police have their dash cameras on, dash cams, uh, that is there to protect the police officers from false allegations. And it also is there to protect people from rogue cops or rogue policemen who are misbehaving. And it just protects everybody. Now, of course they can't, I'm not advocating cameras everywhere and on people inside their homes and you know, you gotta have a warrant to do all, to invade somebody's privacy. But these things are out in the open, they're public officials uh, acting, and how long is it gonna take for the Brooklyn uh, Center Police Department to produce the videos of the arrest? Because there had to be a number of police officers there at the scene, and those video cameras were rolling and sound was taking place. 
And so this thing could be settled real easy. Not like what happened uh, in 2007 where the videos was just released uh, a short, I, I believe this last year, of this young man who was complying and had his hands up, was starting to, uh, the officers were starting to arrest him and he, he was complying and a, an officer just came alongside and tackled him. We've seen the film on this show. So can we trust the police officers in this? No, we can't. Uh, and it's really an important issue because this whole thing affects public trust in the police. And, and of course, we don't trust citizens. Of course, the police don't, nor should they. Um, but we also don't necessarily trust the police officers. So these cameras protect both people, and they can be trusted by showing what took place. So my question here is, how long will it take for the Brooklyn Center Police to release the video, and then we get it over with, and then we know? Uh, the eyewitnesses uh, in the van that said they just shot him, and he was complying, they didn't need to shoot him, they had him handcuffed, uh, they could have misinterpreted some things. So could have the police officers. We just, we just need to know. But don't do what uh, happened uh, in Brooklyn Center before uh, where you wait six years for the video to come out and then it's too late to go after the police officer for what they uh, had done. So uh, anyway, uh, interesting thing up in Brooklyn Center. So also in the news, there was a woman who killed her boyfriend uh, named Eddie and um, you know, another sad deal where somebody uh, gets killed in a domestic uh, violence case, a domestic assault case, and this time a man gets killed. And again, if you've watched my show, I say, how can that be? Because women aren't abusive. <laughs> you know, that's the persona. Yet even when we hear that a woman was being abusive, and people are saying this was an abusive woman. She, and, uh, you know, we still have this deny that women can actually be abusive. And even though there's statistics done by doctoral educated women, empirical studies, mean scientific studies taking place on domestic violence that say women abuse just as much as men and just as violently, People just deny that, and I've had my talks with the former representative, Nora Slawick, who's now running for Maplewood mayor. I had my talk with her, and she didn't want to hear it. It just can't be. Didn't want to see the evidence, could care less about the evidence. Sometime when, uh, you know, can I just give you the, the evidence in the books, and sometime when you might want to look at it, you have it for a resource? No, don't even want that. Uh, not going to take it. And now she's running for mayor of Maplewood. You know, that's not the type of person you want. You want a person there with an open mind to look at the evidence, to see what's going on, and not to promote a propaganda that hurts and destroy people. Uh, we want to have this transparency uh, because, you know, the bottom line here, folks, um, and I, I think some religions are doing a disservice uh, to domestic violence by leaving half of the abusers out of the equation. And, and I don't mean just religions, but uh, it's just society in general. But there's this concept that says people fundamentally are basically good. And you know what? I don't buy that. I don't buy that people are basically good. And you can see it all around us with the violence that's going on, with the stealing, with the cheating, with the lying, uh, with the slander, with whatever, uh, people are not basically good. I, you know what? I can't think of anybody who's basically good. You know, something has to change in that person's life, and that person, individual, has to work at being good. It can't. It doesn't just happen, and we see it with the gangs. We see it with children who are uh, without adult supervision, without good adults, okay, that 
go and say, you, you know, there's no restraint on them. And of course, you have a lot of adults out there saying, hey, we shouldn't have any restraints. Well, well, until something happens to them and they start crying, hey, stop that. You know, you can't do that to me, you know. And, and, and there's just, we're, we're not. And a lot of re religions teach that we're basically good. And that's not right. It's a, it's a misnomer. And I don't know why they do that, to get people into their church so that they can say, yeah, I'll, oh yeah, we're basically good. Uh, and you make me feel basically good, so I'll give you some money. And, but the real issue is we're basically fallen. We, we, we don't do what's right. And we have to have restraint on ourselves, by ourselves, and it has to be taught to us in order to behave in ways that help people and promote goodness. That's why we have a constitution. We have these unalienable rights. You can't steal from me. You can't take my life. Uh, I get to have my, idea, my ideas and my ideology, and I get to work on those and promote those as long as I don't violate somebody else's I constitutional rights and their right to life, their right to freedom of religion. And that mindset has to stop. And, and that was one of the big things that happened with the Ray Woodstrand situation is that there, everybody down there, not everybody, that's too big of a thing, but what I heard was people were blaming parents, they were blaming the police, they were blaming the police administration, they were blaming Landlords, they're blaming the city council, they're blaming the mayor, they're blaming the schools, they're blaming the church, they're blaming media. And then they were going out and saying it takes a village uh, to, to raise a community and, and it takes a community to raise these children. <laughs> Not in a village to raise a community, it takes a village to raise these children, it takes a community to raise these children, but it takes a family to raise the children and it takes a good family and it also takes a good village and a good community. You can't be teaching kids garbage and bad values and then expect a different result. And You can't not hold kids accountable. If you don't hold kids accountable to a good standard, then what do you expect? They're going to deliver something else. And I personally don't believe that our schools, uh, when they teach the evolutionary philosophy that was Hitler's philosophy, and because he believed in survival of the fittest and the raising a race, which what, you know, a superior race, which what evolution was about, and we teach that and you just come from mud, what do, what do you expect? You, you're just chance. You're just random chance. Your value is, even though they say your value is in and of yourself, and you could accomplish anything you set your mind to, which is not true. You can accomplish a lot of things that you set your mind to, but not anything um, you set your mind to. The, it's that message that, that hurts. And if they don't start out, hey, kids, we do bad things. If they don't start out without foundation, hey, adults, we do bad things. And if we don't help each other out, not just hold each other accountable, not in the sense of, oh, you messed up, man, I, you're no longer my friend, I'm gonna pound in you, but hey, let's stop that. We don't do that. Well, you just did it. No, we don't do that, okay? Um, but, well, wait a second, I just did it, but s stop it. Don't do it anymore. And, and be friends and help each other out. That's what's gonna change the community. Realizing that we're bad and we need to have a different behavior than what we, than what we, our tendency will be, and um, we can blame all these things, and all these things are to blame. But then you got to look at yourself. Am I to blame? Am I doing enough? You know, am I doing what I need to do to produce a a good. Uh, a good society, a good village, a good community, a good family. And it starts at home. That's the bottom line. It starts at home. And we, yes, we do need to get together, but 
it's got to be based on good values, on uh, a moral value system uh, that is free from the evolutionary mindset and free from the, we're all basically good. Well, then why are we doing bad things? Why are we down there at the meeting in Eastside St. Paul blaming everybody else? That wasn't a good thing. These kids need to be taught a lesson. You know, really, which ones do? Because not everyone down there participated in the beating of Ray. Some even tried to stop it. Okay, so who are we going to pound on? Who are we going to beat up? And this was another thing that happened. You know, people, you go down there, and, and, and there are problems. There are problems in the police department. There are problems with ourselves. There's are problems with the administration and landlord schools. There are problems. But it, it isn't good enough just to say, here's the problem. Let's, uh, or to say, we got a problem, and here's the person causing the problem. We got to come up with solutions to say, the problem is such and such. Therefore, here's the solution to that problem, and here's how we fix that. And that wasn't being talked about so much. You know, it isn't good enough just to put down 30 cops. You know, and one police officer correctly says, you can't arrest yourself, arrest people out of this situation. And, and it's a very true statement. I don't think people, you think about it and you got to understand it, arresting yourself out of the situation. Arrests only happen after the crime. So the crime takes place, then you do the arrest. How do you stop the crime? The, that has to be stopped in the minds and the attitude of the children and the adults before the crime gets committed. But we got a lot, a lot of adults committing crimes. A lot of adults teaching our children to live a different way. And that's a problem. Uh, but if we break down the family, which is the free social system we have, Otherwise, every other social system costs. We've got to pay people to do it. So we need to strengthen the family so, we can have, so there isn't the cost to society and we don't have to be paying out tons of money uh, to handle the, the, the family. And we're spending tons of money on social uh, issues that if we had good families, accountable families, uh, we wouldn't have to spend that money. Um, so anyway, a lot of uh, pontification going on there, but um, you know the solutions, and, and frankly, with some of our leadership we have, they don't have, in my opinion, the moral compass to find good solutions and to write good relationships or good laws into place so that we can so that we can deal with some of these issues and turn our culture and our society into a di different direction. We need to have different people in those positions. And some of them have been there a long time and they're just collecting their check and trying to get along. And now they're at the point where for uh, quite a few years there, they're the crooks. They're the ones stealing property from people, denying them uh, due process in the court of law and people are getting their houses taken away and condemned and they get no compensation for it even though the houses are in great condition. It's, it's amazing what's going on in St. Paul and um, instead of protecting people's constitutional rights they are going down there and spending money on uh, second-rate ballparks and, and um, things the city just shouldn't be involved in because they're taking your money and they're forcing it from you to spend and forcing you to associate through your money with things you don't believe in or want to participate in. And that's a moral bankruptcy right there. And the city of St. Paul is head, uh, the, they're just dove into that situation and they don't care. And that's a problem. And so, you know, <laughs> it's got to change. And it's the people that got to change the people that are in there that are doing this. And, um, but I don't know that that will ever happen because good people don't speak up. But I take that back. If you don't speak up, you're not a good person. Okay, if you don't address the wrongs, you're not a good person. And yeah, there's a price to pay for that. There's no doubt there's a price to pay for that. Uh, but believe me, that price is worth being paid. 
Okay, uh, update on Ray Woodstrand here. Um, he is improving. He went down from a uh, uh, big tracheotomy to a smaller uh, or tube, uh, to a smaller tube. Uh, he is physically responding uh, to his environment, to his parents. Uh, he's understanding what's being said, uh, but because of the tubes, he can't communicate, he can't talk right now, uh, and is trying to write things out. I, I think he's having some difficulty with that, uh, just kind of relearning that. Um, he's got a long way to go, but he's improving on a daily basis. But, you know, brain injuries, there he is uh, uh, with a golden eagle and his dad there. Um, and he's improving. Uh, that that's the good news. Now, something that's coming up for Ray, uh, his birthday is this Saturday, August 31st. And he has a Caring Bridge site, and what they're going to do for him is they're going to, well, they want people to go to his Caring Bridge site, uh, Ray Woodstrand, and uh, send him a happy bir birthday wish, and they're going to print that off and make a big poster uh, for Ray on his birthday. So that's this Saturday the 31st. So if you want to participate that, you know, it's very easy to go to uh, uh, just Google Caring Bridge and then uh, Ray Woodstrand and uh, go in there and wish him happy birthday uh, because he's just a, he was a great guy, a nice guy. This type of thing should have happened to him. In the, in the, just to, to know in the meantime, the, the man that uh, attacked him, uh, Isaac uh, Maiden has asked for a speedy trial. Uh, my thinking there is that uh, they don't think that the police officers have uh, evidence of, of what he did, may or may or may not, or he may just want to get it over with. But remember, and, and I will give this, and we need to give this, um, we don't know what the evidence is that this person did it. We don't know. Right now, just the police have charged him with um, uh, beating up Ray. There's three other juveniles that have been charged with beating up Ray. Uh, and I, I don't know if they've asked for speedy trials, but you still have to present the evidence. And one thing at the community meeting on Ray Woodstrand was that a lot of people made complaints about the police officers, but in a number of those complaints, I'm going, you're just telling somebody this took place. That's not evidence. You got to have a video. You got to have other witnesses. Uh, you got to give them more than just you saw it happen. Um, they're, they're, you need more than that. Uh, but what was also interesting was people, well, I'll get into that later. Uh, but anyway, Ray's birthday's coming up. Uh, here's a real key aspect that is going untalked about right now and not addressed. How did this all start? How did this riot in East St. Paul and these gang members, how did this meeting all start that Ray happened to walk in on? It started with two girls that were going to get in a fight that eventually did get into a fight. And then the texting and the phone calls went out and said, hey, meet over here. We're, there's two girls are going to have a fight. And that fight took place. Ray happened to walk in in the area about uh, on that. And these gang of uh, 30 people, and then Ray got attacked there. And nobody's talking about these two girls and the violence that they were committing not only to themselves, but in a sense incited a riot that caused the, the, the uh, beating of Ray Woodstrand. Of course, two girls, you know, again, girls don't abuse themselves or others. Right, okay. So are these girls, have they been charged? Are something gonna happen to them? What are the charges against them? I mean, that needs to be addressed because these type of girls that get caught in this abuse cycle of abusing themselves and others uh, end up being like the woman who killed her boyfriend uh, in Shorewood. 
uh, to, you know, we, we have to address the violence amongst women. And if I, you go down to that capital and there's no mention of women abusing. There's none. Uh, and, you, you know, maybe a charge for inciting a riot would deter this type of event. Uh, that's something that needs to be looked in. But women do abuse. And I tell these legislators, and you need to tell them, you need to give them a call and say, hey, we got to address this aspect that women abuse. Do you know the number one sex that abuses kids? The number one gender that abuses kids is women. They're the number one abusers of children. And people will say, well, women, uh, they're around children more than men are. Okay, so what? Does that justify it? No, not at all. Does that mean we get to ignore that aspect and don't address it and don't face? You know, a lot of men get charged with abuses because they are being hit, beaten, uh, stabbed, whatever, by a woman, and they fight back or they defend themselves. Defending yourself, it, you can be charged with abuse. And it happens over and over. You can get a restraining order just because somebody says you abused them, uh, wh whether you did or not. So, big issue that needs to be addressed. All right, we're going to go on to the main subject.